Well, this morning is our last message in our next 50 series. Uh, This morning is also what we're calling Commitment Sunday. As many of you know, it's Commitment Sunday today. We are asking as a church this final question together. What's next for our commitment? What's next for our commitment? We want each of you to consider what you might commit to give over and above your regular giving to the next 50 campaign for the next two years, two-year commitment. Uh, At the doors, uh, you were offered another copy of your commitment card. Uh, Looks like this, these commitment cards. Now, some of you brought your commitment card with you this morning. Well done to any of you who did that. Uh, You have been thinking, you have been praying, Uh, You filled out your card and you brought it with you today in anticipation of what we're going to do. Others of you may have forgot your commitment card. Let's not raise our hands if you forgot. But no problem. I hope that you've had a opportunity at the doors to get a fresh copy of one of these commitment cards. And uh, also you should know that there are plenty of pins there in the seat backs in front of you so that you can fill these out. And it may even be that during this sermon you're finally making that sort of final decision as to what you believe God's leading you to commit. And you can feel free to uh, write that down even while the sermon is going on as you feel led to do. Now, some of you this morning may be asking this question. Why even do these commitment cards in the first place? Like, why are we doing these commitment cards? Why don't you just open up the next 50 fund and encourage people to give towards it and just go forward from there? Why do commitment cards? Well, I wanna share with you at the outset Two, two important reasons, not one, but two, two important reasons uh, why we're doing commitment cards today. First, these commitment cards, I believe, give us a gauge for how we are doing uh, with regard to uh, this campaign over the next two years. Um, The commitment cards give us a sort of accurate feel, if you will, for what God is prompting his people to give. Um, The commitments, as you know, could come in lower or they could come in higher than we project. I want you to keep in mind that we are committed to staying debt-free as a church. That's very important. And so the pledged amounts help us know if perhaps we've overshot or undershot our $7.5 million goal for phase one of this endeavor. And They help us know whether we perhaps need to retool some plans or maybe change the timing of our plans based on how the commitments come in. So it's important for that. Secondly, I want you to know, the commitment cards are also good for you. And they're good for me. They're good for us as a church. Why? Because they give us a concrete, worshipful moment of commitment. These commitment cards give us a defining moment as a church where we can each say, God, here's what I believe you're calling me to give over and above my regular giving. I'm going to budget for it. I'm going to plan for it. And then I'm going to give it. And, and that kind of commitment is important, not only for us as individuals, it's important for us collectively as a whole church. It's like a marker in our church's history where we can look back and we can say, that was the moment back there when we together stepped forward as a church and we resolved to step up and make some much needed renovations that would set us up as a church for 50 years and beyond. So commitment cards, they're good for gauging whether our aims are realistic. And secondly, commitment cards are good because they give individuals and the church a specific moment to say, I'm all in. Now, one more thing I should say before we get into the text today. Some of you feel a bit nervous about this whole thing. Like we've got some feedback. Some of you are feeling a little bit nervous that turning our commitments cards in is gonna be a little too public, a little too dramatic, a little too showy perhaps. I want you to know, I get it. I resonate with that, completely understand. And I want to relieve your fears right now, all right? We are not going to make you get up out of your seats while the music's playing and walk to the front and sign your commitment cards in blood, and then light them on fire and place them on the flaming altar, all right? We're not gonna do any of that. Uh, Rest assured, Uh, here's what we are going to do, okay? I'm going to preach for another 30 minutes or so, and then I'm gonna lead us in a prayer of dedication, 
And then we're going to stand and we're going to sing a response song just like we do every Sunday. And then I'm going to come back up and I'm going to share some closing stuff. And then I'm going to say the benediction. And then as you leave today at each of the major exit points, there's going to be a basket, a next 50 basket, as you will, uh, if you will, where you can just place your commitment cards prayerfully as you leave this place. That's it. No fanfare, no song and dance, just a simple opportunity to turn your cards in at the doors. Or you can even commit online, and I'll show you how to do that toward the end. So it's just that simple. Sound good with everyone? Everybody breathe a sigh of relief. That's the plan, okay? All right. Okay, well, let's turn then in our Bibles to a passage that I think fits perfectly with this moment for us as a church, a really fitting passage. Please turn with me to Exodus chapter 35, Exodus chapter 35. If you're using the Bibles provided there in the seat backs, you'll find the passage on page 75 of those Bibles, Exodus chapter 35. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 29. Now, as you're turning there, I want you to know that in this passage, Moses follows God's instructions to lead the people of Israel, wait for it, in a building project. I kid you not. Moses is leading the people in a building project to build and construct God's elaborate tent known as the tabernacle. And Moses leads a capital campaign to bring in the needed materials and supplies and specialized labor that were necessary to pull off this building project. Moses invites, as you'll see, he invites everybody to get involved. Nobody's left out. He says, everyone has the opportunity to contribute. Everybody has the opportunity to commit. And so we pick it up, Exodus chapter 35, and I'll read beginning in verse 4. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense and onyx stones and stones for the setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece. Let every skilled craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, its tents and its covering, its hooks and frames and bars, its pillars, its bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat and the veil of the screen the table with its poles and all of its utensils and the bread of presence, the lampstand also for the light with its utensils and its lamps and the oil for the light and the altar of incense with its poles and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense and the screen for the door and the door of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its grating of bronze, its poles and all of its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases and the screen for the gates of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle and the peg of the court and uh, their cords and finally worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron and the priests and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses and they came everyone whose hearts stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting and for all of its service and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue or purple or scarlet yarns or fine linen, goat's hair or tanned ram skins or goat skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. And everyone who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen 
All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. And the leaders brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breast piece and spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. I didn't need their help, but I was delighted that they wanted to help me that day. My lawn was overgrown and it was time to mow the lawn. And my kids, who were much younger then, a few of them wanted to help me mow the lawn. Now, as you know, mowing a lawn could be dangerous for kids, and so I wanted to make sure they were wearing the proper shoes and we were taking all the proper safety precautions. But then one at a time, I would take one of my kids and I would put their hands onto the mower's push bar, and then I would wrap my hands, one on one side, one on the other hand, keeping a firm grip on the safety, and I would push most of the work, and they would push. And on we would go that way, my hands around them, keeping the mower gently going straight in its path, guiding as we got to each turn. I didn't need my kids' help. In fact, it probably took twice as long to mow the lawn that day, right? But I was absolutely delighted that I had their help. It was a joy to work together as we made those fresh cut pathways through that green lawn that day. It reminds me of how God works with us. Brothers and sisters, I think you would agree. God doesn't need our help, does he? God can sovereignly run his universe just fine by himself, thank you very much. I mean, God keeps every planet in its orbit. God manages every molecule. He's an awesome, omnipotent, resplendent God. God doesn't need our help. But here's what I want you to see this morning. God does allow us to help. God doesn't need our help. He allows us to help. And he is delighted when we help. God allows his people to get involved in his work in the world. Just like my kids helping me mow the lawn that day and having a blast doing it. In the same way, God allows us to get involved in what he's doing in the world and in the church. We see this in the passage today, don't we? God was intending to build an elaborate tent called the tabernacle. Uh, this tent would have ornate curtains with beautiful colors and wooden framing and stakes and poles and ropes. This tent would have goat skin weather shields and, and gold plated furniture and solid gold utensils and priestly clothes loaded with costly precious jewels. It would have an altar and a wash basin. The whole structure of this tent uh, would communicate theological ideas about God's holy presence with his people. Ideas about the need for forgiveness through substitutionary sacrifice. God's tent would be pitched right in the middle of the Israelite camp, and yet God's holy presence there over the Ark of the Covenant would be shielded from human eyes. And God could have just built this tent himself. In fact, God could have just beamed the tent down from heaven right there on the desert floor. I mean, can you imagine this? There's the Israelites, they're wandering around in the desert and suddenly, voila, they come upon this elaborate tent and God tells them, this is my tent. Perhaps it could have happened that way. After all, that's how God did it with manna, isn't it? I mean, every morning they would wake up, come out of their tents and voila, there's the manna on the ground. Just pick it up. I suppose God could have done that with the tabernacle, but he didn't, did he? That's not how God does it. No. Here's how God does it. God instructs Moses to ask the people if they would donate the needed supplies for the tabernacle. 
Moses, God says, make the ask. Ask for gold and silver and bronze and colored yarns and fine linen. Ask for the goat's hair and the ram skins and the goat skins and the acacia wood and the oil and the anointing spices. Ask for the onyx stones and the precious stones of many kinds. Make the ask, Moses, for the skilled labor, the labor that's needed, the craftsmen who can make the curtains and hooks and frames and bars and pillars and bases and ark and the veils and the temp table and the utensils and the lampstand and the altars and the basin and the garments for the priests. Make the ask, Moses. And Moses indeed makes the ask for all all of these donations. We see that there in verses 4 through 19, where Moses puts forward the need for all of these things to the people. And listen, this is a big fundraising goal right here, right? This is a gutsy capital campaign. I'm sure you would agree. But then we see the surprising, overwhelming, response of the people. There in verses 20 through 29, the people come and they give and they commit. And I want to make four observations about the people's contribution right there in that final section, verses 20 through 29. Four observations. First, notice with me that the people contributed gladly. They contributed gladly gladly. Uh, look again at verse 21. We read that they came, everyone whose heart stirred him. Notice that. Everyone whose spirit moved him and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting. And then verse 22. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart. Notice that. They brought all of these various items. If you jump up to verse 26, we read that all of the women whose hearts stirred them, used their skill to spin. And then jump down to verse 29. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them, notice that, heart moved them to bring anything for the work of the Lord that he had commanded Moses to be done. They brought it as not a forced thing, but as a free will offering to the Lord. Put all that together and what do we see? Well, no one here is being forced. No one is being coerced. No one is being manipulated. They were simply being asked. And here they came with glad hearts, with willing hearts, with joyful hearts. And all of this, I think, shows us something of the very heart of God himself. God is pleased when his people contribute to his work gladly, not because they're forced, but because they are honored and they're delighted that they get to pitch in, to be involved. This is true, I think, not only in the Old Testament, as we see here, but also in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, reflecting perhaps on the very tone found in this Exodus story, the Apostle Paul writes this to the Corinthians. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Notice the emphasis on God in this text. God loves a cheerful giver. This is God's attitude. This is the kind of contribution that most pleases God. So church family, let me ask you today, whether you're contributing your time, your treasure, or your talents to the work of God, I ask you, do you do so gladly or begrudgingly? Be reminded here from this text that God is deeply pleased when our contributions come from willing and glad hearts. The people here contributed gladly. Notice next, they also contributed universally. They contributed universally. Listen again as I read these verses with emphasis, beginning in verse 21, we read that they came, everyone whose heart stirred him, Verse 22, they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart. Verse 23, and everyone who possessed blue or purple scarlet gave. And verse 24, everyone who could make a contribution. Farther in the verse, everyone who possessed acacia wood. Verse 25, every skilled woman spun. Verse 27, 
the leaders get involved and the leaders brought this and that. Verse 29, all the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them, brought. You get the point, right? Everybody got in on this when it came to the contribution for the tabernacle. Young and old, rich and poor, men and women, leaders and everyday people, everybody had some skin in the game. No one was left out. Again, we see, I think, that this story illustrates how God tends to work among his people, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament. With Israel, as you can see here, every member had something that they could bring, everybody. In the church, God has given spiritual gifts to every member of his church, and every member then should use those gifts to make their contribution. The church is compared, as you know, to a body with many body parts that are all interconnected, and we've all got to do our part so that the body can function well and in a healthy way. We need everybody all in. The Apostle Peter put it this way in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. He said, as each has received a gift, use it. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So are you a Christian today? If so, then the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and the Spirit has gifted you in various ways to serve and build up the church. Are you stewarding your spiritual gifts well? Are you using them? In the church, no one should sit on the sidelines. In fact, there is no bench on the sideline because everybody with the church should be on the field, right? We're all first string. Everybody contributes. Now, this is why with the Next 50 campaign, we're inviting everyone to get involved. No matter your age, no matter your stage of life, no matter the amount that you can contribute. So, whether you're a child or a college student or newlyweds or empty nesters or you're a senior, all of us in any of these categories, all of us can get involved. There's something, would you agree? There's something so fitting. There's, there's, there's something so biblical when we can all pitch in, everyone, so that together we can contribute to the work that God is doing in our church. The Israelites contributed universally. But notice also they contributed uniquely. They contributed uniquely. Now look, this observation is similar to point number two, but slightly different. Follow me here. Did you notice that different items, different amounts, different skills were brought by the people? So again, to look at these verses, uh, look there in verse 22, we read that some came and brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and, armlet, and, and armlets and gold objects. In 23, other people had blue or purple or scarlet yarns or fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ramskins, and they brought those things. And then in verse 24, we read that other people were able to contribute silver or bronze and so forth. And then in verse 25, we see that some people actually gave skills, right? There you have skillful women spinning the fabrics that were needed. And then verse 27, we see that the leaders join in in some special way. Perhaps they brought some of the especially press, precious items like the uh, stones for the ephod and so forth. Here's the point. Not everyone brought jewelry. Not everyone brought fabrics. Not everyone brought leather. Not everyone brought skill to spin the yarn. Not everyone brought precious jewels. Not everyone brought everything, but everyone brought something. Everyone brought their unique contribution, and this added up to exactly what was needed for the project to build God's house. In fact, if you keep reading in Exodus, they get to a point where the people brought so many supplies that Moses finally had to step in and say, stop, stop contributing. We have enough. We can build God's house full and well. 
And so just like God's people each contributed uniquely for the building of the tabernacle here, God's people today contribute uniquely for the building up of the church. Again, we can apply this passage, I think, to the use of our spiritual gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. And let me remind you of the Apostle Paul's words found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me read this for us from the screen. Paul writes, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many If the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? Next screen. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Be reminded this morning, Christ Community Church, that your unique contributions to this church matter. So whether you teach or lead or administrate, or whether you give care and mercy, or whether you're gifted in music or faith or prayer or generosity or hospitality or service of many kinds, so many other gifts we might list, whatever unique part you play, please know that you are valued. Please know that your contribution is unique. And please know that we need you in this body to use your gifts in this place. As it pertains to our next 50 campaign, rest assured that your unique gift matters for this initiative. Look, whether you're able to to raise and give a very large amount, which many of you perhaps can do, or whether you can hardly rub two pennies together and are giving a very small amount by comparison. Either way and anything in between, I want to encourage you to give your own unique offering to the Lord and don't compare your gift to anyone else. You give what God has called you to give. Realize that we're doing this together, right? Together. And all of our unique contributions add up to a corporate expression of gratitude to our God. All right, well, the Israelites contributed gladly, universally, and uniquely, but... I have a question for you. I wonder if you're asking the same thing I'm asking at this point. The question is this. Where did these people get all these supplies? Where did these people get all these valuables that they're now bringing to Moses for the tabernacle? Last time I checked, this was a ragtag nomadic nation of recently freed slaves who are now wandering around in the Sinai desert. So where in the world did they get all these precious and valuable resources? And here's the answer. It's actually our last observation today. The Israelites contributed gladly. They contributed universally. They contributed uniquely. But then finally, they contributed from God's prior provision. I want to show you this. Remember the Exodus story? Do you remember that after God pounded the Egyptians with plague after plague after plague, God finally made the hearts of the Egyptians predisposed to hand over their jewels and their fabrics and their valuables to the Israelites on their way out. It's like they loaded the Israelites down with all their stuff and they're like, here's my stuff. Now get out of town and get out quick, they said. Look what God told Moses from the start, okay? Exodus chapter three, beginning in verse 20. Here's what God said to Moses. God said, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. 
But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. That was God's plan from square one. Now look at how it actually panned out on the actual night of the Exodus. We read in Exodus 12 that the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened and their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold and jewelry and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they ask. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Come on, isn't that awesome? Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Can you see the brilliance of our God in this text from the very beginning? God was already intending to wear down the Egyptians so that they would have soft hearts and be predisposed to load up the Israelites with gold and jewels and supplies so that Several months later, those very same Israelites would have exactly the materials that they needed to contribute to God's house. In other words, they built God's house with Egyptian plunder. <laughs> See, here's the principle. God provides what he requires. God provides what he requires. God provides for his people what he requires of his people. That's what God did with the Israelites. And that's what God does with us. So listen, if you, as a Christian believer this morning, if you become convinced that God has called you to something something you read in scripture, something he's laying on your heart to do. If you become absolutely convinced that God himself has in fact called you to something, you can rest assured that the same God will also provide you with everything you need to carry out his will. God provides what he requires. God provides what he requires. Let me give you some examples. Has God called you to marriage? Has God called you perhaps to singleness? Has God called you to parenting or grandparenting? If God has called you to any of these very important roles, keep in mind that he will also provide you with everything you need for that role. He will provide you with the patience and wisdom and power and support that you need to live out your marriage or your singleness or your parenting and to do it well. God provides what he requires. Has God called you this morning to take on some unique ministry? Uh, perhaps God is calling you to serve the kids in this church or, or to share Christ on your high school campus or, or to care for a needy friend or, or maybe God has called you to reach out evangelistically to uh, the other seniors in your living residence. Um, if God has called you, called you to some particular ministry focus and you know it is his call, Rest assured, he will also provide you with the things that you need, the creativity, the energy, the resources, the strength to carry out your calling well. God provides what he requires. Perhaps this morning has God called you to endure suffering? Has God called some of you to be content no matter your circumstances? If so then you can pray with the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Christ will strengthen you to suffer well. Christ himself will suffer you, will strengthen you that you might be content in every circumstance. God in Christ by his spirit will provide what he requires of you. Now, let's apply this principle to our financial giving in general and especially to our Next 50 campaign. My friend, have you prayed? Have you planned? Have you sensed God's leading for you and your family to give a certain specific amount to the Next 50 campaign? Well, if in fact God really is leading you to that amount, I want to encourage you today 
that our very same God will also provide everything you need to joyfully, faithfully honor that commitment. You can trust him to provide whatever he's called you to do. Just like Israel in the story, our contributions come ultimately from God. Everything we can give to him has come ultimately from him. God provides what he requires. And then, of course, I think of the greatest example of this principle. Where do we see most clearly in Scripture the fact that God provides what he requires? Well, we see it, friends, most clearly at the cross, don't we? We see it at the cross where God provided his beloved son. Think about it. What does God ultimately require of us? Well, he requires not just goodness. God requires perfection. God requires absolute holiness. God requires righteousness. And each of us falls woefully short of God's good standards because of our sin against God. But here's the thing. God has provided what he requires by sending his son, Jesus, to die in our place so that we can be forgiven and made righteous by faith in him. Uh, Jesus lived the righteous life that God requires. And then Jesus credits his righteousness to all those who would put their faith in him. Brothers and sisters, aren't you thankful that God's greatest requirement, perfect righteousness, has been provided for us in Christ? God provided what he requires for you and for me in Jesus. What a wonder that is. If you're not a Christian today, uh, I want you to know that this is the central message of the gospel. God has provided for you the perfect record that he requires of you. He did this by putting Jesus on the cross where Jesus took the judgment that our sins deserve. Now God offers you forgiveness and righteousness if you will only repent of your sin and put your trust in Jesus. Cry out to him even today and you can be forgiven and made right with God for all eternity. What a gift. Well, in conclusion, Christ Community Church, uh, we're back now to our opening question then. In light of Moses and this tabernacle, in light of us and all that we're called to do, what's next for our contribution? That's the question. Remember, God doesn't need our help, but God does allow us joyfully to help. Aren't you thankful for that? So each of us has to decide what God would have us uniquely give. And this is my prayer. Brothers and sisters, my prayer is that your gift, whatever it is, will be given gladly, joyfully, intentionally, and from the heart. And it's my prayer that all of us would give out of the abundance of what God has already given us in Jesus Christ.